Uh, thank you for uh, coming out tonight. I, I'm delighted to be here. I think early on when I first started to, to do some research on this case, um, I watched uh, Will a Real Terrorist Please Stand Up, Saul Landau's uh, wonderful documentary, and I saw this, the, a clip, a film clip of uh, the bombing here uh, back in whenever it was, uh, 72, 72, 73, uh, and I must say it looks a lot better today than it did in that clip. Uh, <laughs> I'm I am really delighted to, to be here, and I want to say uh, thank you to my keepers for the last uh, week. Uh, I couldn't have done uh, better than to have uh, Alicia and Bill and Nancy and Cheryl uh, driving me, taking me, making sure that I get to the places I'm supposed to get, and I really do uh, want to say thank you to them. Uh, I have to say thank you to them because I have two more days. Uh, <laughs> I have to worry that they're going to dump me off somewhere on a highway. Um, you may wonder why a Canadian journalist who has never been an activist, uh, whose books are all about Nova Scotia and Canada, would end up writing a book about the Cuban Five uh, and would end up becoming, in a certain sense, an advocate for the case of the Cuban Five. Uh, I have to admit, I wondered myself from time to time, and I certainly wondered uh, on September 12th at noon uh, when I did something I haven't done, I don't think, since university, which was to pick up a, a, a poster and carry it around outside the White House uh, to, with, the, with the demonstration, uh, because I really did uh, feel the need to do that, and it felt good, in fact, actually, to do that. Uh, I should say that uh, I came across the case of the Cuban Five totally by accident. Uh, as I said, I'm Canadian and I did what Canadians do. My wife and I went for a vacation in Cuba uh, back, first of all, in 2004, and we stayed in a resort called Hibico, which is about 45 minutes from Havana. And Hibico uh, was a wonderful resort with great sand beaches and snorkeling and all of those things, uh, but it didn't have great internet connections. And so in order to uh, communicate, uh, to do that sort of thing, uh, you had to stand in line at an internet cafe uh, that, that was on the second floor of, of uh, the, above the lobby. And in order to get your two minutes on the dial-up connection, you probably had to wait an hour or two hours uh, in order to get there. And uh, one uh, morning I was standing there and I saw this poster uh, on the wall. And it said, Prisoners of the Empire. And it was spelled I-M-P-I-R-E. And it had a whole bunch of writing on it. It wasn't, it wasn't one of those artistic uh, give me five posters that you see today. It was, you know, it was uh, probably 12 point type. Uh, but it didn't tell me anything that I really needed to know about the case. It told me that there were some guys who were in jail and it seemed to be unjust. Uh, but I, got it, I, I, was sort of in, I was vaguely intrigued enough by that that when I went home, I googled uh, it and found that there was very little information on the web at that time about the Cuban Five, uh, but enough that I was able to write a column about it for a newspaper uh, where I was writing at the time. And then I promptly forgot about it. It was you know, one of those things that one does. And then in uh, 2009, uh, I had a contract for a couple of nonfiction books after I'd written a novel, and then I decided I was going to go back and write another novel. And I'd come up with an idea uh, for a, a love story, uh, a novel that was to be set partly in Cuba and partly in Nova Scotia. And the Cuba part, uh, you'll understand if you've ever been through a Nova Scotia winter, uh, you'll understand why I wanted to do research in, in Cuba at that time. I arrived in Havana in May of 2009, uh, and I hired a guy to be my tour guide, to take me to see the Havana that I wouldn't see as a tourist because I knew that I needed to do that in order to get background for the novel that I wanted to write. It turned out to be this fascinating guy, Alexander uh, Treyas, and uh, we became friends over the course of a couple of days, uh, and we ended up uh, on the deck uh, outside the famous Hotel National uh, drinking mojitos and smoking cigars and talking wisely about the state of the world. And it turned out that, that he was somebody who paid a lot of attention to politics. 
uh, including Canadian politics, which, which you rarely get when you travel internationally. And, and this was a guy who could talk to me about our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, uh, and what he said made a lot of sense to me, I have to say. Uh, and then we got talking about American politics, and of course, as I said, this was shortly after President Obama was elected. And I had talked to a lot of my uh, friends in the United States who, who were reasonably optimistic at this time that things were going to get better between Cuba and the United States. So I put that to him, and I said, you know, what, what do you think? Uh, without missing a beat, he said, nothing will change in the relations between the United States and, and Cuba until they solve the pr problem of the five. And so I was back to this, the prisoners of the empire again and the five. Luckily, Alex was a much better explainer uh, of that story. And he took me through some of the background. Uh, he raised so, so what became flags for me in, in, in terms of wanting to find out more, one of which was the involvement of Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, in this case. And uh, so I, I became, and he told me I could look it up, and he told me where to look up certain things on the internet, uh, and I started to do that. And by the time I got home this time, I knew that that is what I wanted to do rather than the uh, book that I'd originally set out to do. Um, in terms of thinking about this story in an American context, um, and I think it's important because we're trying to talk to Americans about uh, how they need to see this case. Just put it in this context. Think of uh, what would have happened if before 9-11 the US government had its own agents inside Afghanistan and if those agents had infiltrated Al-Qaeda and knew about the plot uh, to attack America and were able to somehow as a result get that message back to the United States and do something about it. If we knew that and if they were successful, they would be heroes today in, in America. But take it another step further and think about this. If the United States had shared the information that it had gathered with the Afghan government, and if the Afghan government, instead of arresting the terrorists who were plotting the attack on America, had arrested the agents who were there to stop that, you suddenly have some idea of the Cuban situation and how the Cubans see what happened. They sent agents to Florida to stop terrorism, uh, and those are the agents who are arrested. I know that most of you in, the, in this room are perhaps more familiar uh, than I am with this case, but I'm just going to do the, the, the quick Coles Notes version of it uh, just for anyone who isn't. And that is that in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the exile uh, groups in, in Florida ramped up their attacks. They thought that, that Cuba was going to fall like a lot of uh, former countries of the Soviet Union, uh, and it was all going to be very simple and straightforward. And they got very frustrated when it didn't happen, and they began to uh, ramp up the attacks that they had against Cuba. Now, obviously, these attacks, you know, we talked about the, back in 1972, the, these attacks have been going on forever. Uh, and many of them have been terrorist attacks. And, and if we want to talk about terrorist attacks, let's define it. We're talking about attacks against civilians for a larger political purpose. These were terrorist attacks. And, and uh, some of them included uh, setting off bombs at hotels, uh, as you mentioned, in Havana. And there was a, a Canadian who was killed in one of those. There were dozens of people injured in those attacks. These were not only violations of international law and of, of Cuban law, these attacks were violations of American law. The American Neutrality Act, which has been around for a long time, prohibits anyone from plotting attacks on a third country from inside America. They could have been arrested. They weren't. This was Florida, right? Basically what happened was that uh, these kind of attacks against Cuba were ignored, or if sometimes, sometimes there were some investigations, but very rarely were there ever charges that came out of them. And if there were charges, there were almost never convictions because Florida juries knew better uh, than to convict these exile uh, terrorists. Um, so the Cubans, to protect themselves, sent agents to Florida. Uh, the agents who we now know of as the Cuban Five were part of a group called the WASP Network, and there were actually about two dozen of them uh, who were 
sort of loosely connected whose jobs were to infiltrate these uh, groups, find out what they were plotting and send information back to Havana. And that's what they did and sometimes they were successful. There are plots that are, are documented in the book uh, where it's very clear that, that it was the Cuban agents who stopped uh, not only attacks against Cuba, but attacks in which Americans uh, could very easily have been uh, killed or injured as well. Uh, they didn't stop them all. The, the 1997 hotel bombings is an example of that. Uh, although the, the, the agents of uh, the Q who, who became the Cuban Five were in fact involved in trying to find information about those bombs and had some information developed. But in, in the spring of 1998, Cuban agents uncovered another uh, more sinister plot, and that was to blow up an airplane filled with tourists that would be coming to Cuba from, the United, uh, from Canada or Latin America or Europe. Uh, hundreds of people would have been killed in an attack like that. And the, the, the purpose clearly was to scare off tourists, to, to undermine the fledgling tourist economy in uh, Cuba. The Cubans understood that this would be very difficult to stop because it was being financed and planned in the United States. It was going to be carried out by mercenaries in other countries. So in order to try and stop this, um, Fidel Castro enlisted the aid of his good friend, the Nobel Prize winning novelist uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who happened to be in Havana at the time working on a story, but was on his way to the United States for a week-long workshop at Princeton University, writing workshop. And so Fidel asked him to take this message to, to Washington to give it to Bill Clinton, who happened to be Gabriel Garcia Marquez's other good friend. So the, it was a nice little uh, connection in that. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, while he waited for his meeting at the White House, uh, was in a hotel in Washington uh, working on his memoir, and he refused to leave the room because he had this, this paper from Fidel. Uh, and he didn't trust the, the flimsy uh, safety deposit or safety box in his, in his room, so he didn't go outside. He ordered in room service for a number of days while he waited. Anyway, he, he did finally get that message uh, to the White House. Uh, in his report, he says he thinks that uh, people in the White House took this uh, very seriously, and we know that there was an instruction that went out after that to the FBI. And the FBI were essentially told to investigate uh, this allegation. The United States took it seriously enough that they also, uh, through the Federal Aviation Administration, issued a warning uh, to, to air airlines uh, about this potential plot. So they, they, they clearly believed that this was a plot that was going to happen. Uh, in June of 1998, a delegation of FBI agents flew to Havana to meet with a delegation of Cuban state security agents. So it was more agent to agent meeting. And over the course of three days in a workhouse uh, just on the edge of Havana, the uh, Cubans turned over a great deal of evidence that they'd gathered, not just about the airplane plot, but also about other plots that, that uh, including the hotel bombings. There were bomb fragments that they gave the, the FBI. There were documents. There were wiretapped conversations that they had. Uh, there were confessions from low-level mercenaries about some of the attacks that had gone on. They believe the FBI took it very seriously and said, we will go back to the, they said, the FBI said to them, we will go back to the United States, we will investigate, and we will get back to you. Instead, uh, three months later, uh, the FBI swooped in on September 12, 1998, and arrested uh, the men who became the Cuban Five, as opposed to the people who were plotting the terrorist attack. So that's when I said the, the thing about 9-11, you can understand why there would be some uh, concern about that. It's a, you know, that's that's the 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 I guess the long short version of the story. And there's there there are is a much longer version and a much more nuanced version in the book. Uh, and I could certainly go into it, uh, go into the the details of some of the things. But as uh, my friends from the International Committee know, I have a tendency sometimes to go on, and, and I'm going to try to keep it in, in check tonight. But I wanted, I, I wanted to talk about two things uh, that d don't relate so much to the plots, but to the people. Uh, I, I encourage you uh, to come up and have a look at uh, these watercolors afterwards. Uh, and to find out a little bit more about Antonio Guerrero, who is one of the five who is uh, still in prison. I'm just going to read you a tiny bit, which is from, 
th these guys are, you know, they, they were, they, they're considered heroes now. Uh, they were ordinary guys who were put in uh, difficult, extraordinary situations. And that's important, I think, to understand. You know, these are guys who had families, wives, girlfriends, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And they, you know, they're, they're less, uh, I know that they're considered heroes today, but, but, but it's important to think of them as human beings. And Tony, um, Tony arrived in Key West in 1993. And his first job uh, was as a busboy at a restaurant uh, in Key West. And this is how he met uh, the woman he fell in love with. And we're not going to talk about this from Tony's perspective, but from the perspective of a woman named Maggie ba Becker, who was his girlfriend for many years. Maggie Becker wasn't sure what to call it, not love, not yet anyway. She liked to dance. He taught salsa dancing. He was Cuban, some kind of engineer, he'd said. But he sp spoke virtually no English, so it was difficult for, to know for sure. She was from Pennsylvania, an artsy type. Her rudimentary Spanish dredged up from the memory recesses of a mostly forgotten semester back in college. For now, there was dancing, and that seemed to be more than enough. They'd met by chance a few weeks earlier. Maggie's landlady and her roommate, who'd spent the evening drinking and dancing at a local waterfront bar called the Pier House, had met a couple of guys and invited them back home. Maggie was already asleep when they arrived around midnight. I woke to the sound of a crash, she would remember later. I thought the cat had knocked over the keyboard of my computer. When she went to the apartment's living room to investigate, she discovered a salsa party in preparation. They were moving all the furniture and rolling up the rug. They invited Maggie to join them, but even though she definitely liked to dance salsa, I was tired and it was late. Besides, there were already four of them. So she made her excuses, breezed through the perfunctory introductions. Maggie, this is some guy who played in a band and another guy who didn't speak English, and she went back to sleep. <laughs> but the guy who didn't speak English, Antonio Guerrero, a busboy at the pier house, was clearly intrigued by Maggie. Later, he'd asked her landlady about her and if he could ask her to a dance, to a dance. This is in Cuba, she told him, and well, one thing had led to another, and now Maggie wasn't sure what this thing had become. With a mix of rudimentary words and gestures, they told each other their life stories. He told her he was Cuban, but that he'd actually been born in Miami. His dad had been a professional ball player. He showed Maggie his baseball card. In 1959, after his father was injured playing ball, the family resettled in Havana. Tony was only a toddler at the time. In 1978, when he was 19, he won a scholarship to study aeronautical and construction engineering in the old Soviet Union. There, he acknowledged without apology, he'd married a Cuban woman. In 1983, after he graduated, they'd returned to Cuba, where he got a job working on an expansion to the airport at Santiago de Cuba. They had a child, Antonio Jr., in 1985, but the marriage hadn't worked out, and they divorced in 1989. Antonio had then moved to Panama, where he'd had another relationship. At least he was honest, she thought. <laughs> with another woman whom he'd married. She was pregnant when he decided to move to the United States last year in search of better opportunities. She'd been supposed to join him, he said, but, well, that hadn't worked out either. That was the bad news, along with the fact that Tony liked the syrupy, popular Spanish singer Julio Iglesias. <laughs> the good news was that he had been honest about his romantic history. Plus, he was, Maggie had already discovered, a brilliant chess player, a painter, and a musician, not to forget an excellent salsa dancer. Whatever this was, whatever it would become, it seemed worth exploring without worrying too much about what to call it. Maggie wasn't the only one wondering about what to call their relationship and how to explain it to others. While Tony had been honest about his various romantic entanglements, there were pieces of his life story about which he couldn't say. For starters, he was a Cuban intelligence agent. When he'd moved to Panama in 1991, it was on orders from Cuban state security. He'd arrived with a shopping list of assignments, but his primary objective had been to establish a history for himself there that would make an eventual move to Miami seem more natural. Just as an aside, the, the, the Cubans here play the long game, right? I mean, they, they're putting somebody in Panama who they're eventually going to send to Miami because he needs a backstory. 
But Tony's Panamanian wife, who didn't have a clue about his other life either, had balked when Tony's bosses back in Havana told him he was moving to Florida in May of 1992. As one Cuban state security report noted, the woman, quote, would not accept any of the explanations given about the advantages they would enjoy in the U.S. After this, she asked for a divorce, and Tony accepted. So what now would his bosses think of Tony getting involved with another woman? And what did he think of it? That was in 92. They did establish very quickly a relationship. <coughs> there, was an, there were discussions about whether they should move in together, uh, whether they should have a baby. She wanted to have a baby at the time. There was a, these discussions that went on. Uh, unknown to her, he was having these discussions with Cuban state security back in Havana. Uh, and so when he was arrested, she found out for the first time that the person that she was by then living with and very much in love with was also a Cuban intelligence agent and kept all this stuff from her. At the very beginning, you know, she was understandably upset by this. <laughs> But she turned around and became part of the defense team uh, because that's, that was her sense of Tony and, and what he meant to her and, and all that. So you know, if you think about it, uh, the, the thing that, that is worse in a relationship like that, the deception, uh, she was able to, to accept. And when I met her a couple of years ago when I was researching the book, uh, they, they were no longer in a relationship. Uh, Tony had been in jail at that point for 13 years. Uh, but they were still friends. They still emailed back and forth. And she was still a supporter of his. That tells you something about who these guys were. Uh, I want to talk more, I think, about Gerardo. Each of the five have their own uh, compelling stories, uh, personal stories. But Gerardo, as you know, is the one serving the double life plus 15 year sentence in jail. And what we need to know is if the effort uh, to free Gerardo fails, uh, he will never see Cuba again. He will die alone in prison. And I think uh, it's really important that we understand a little bit more about who he was. He is the guy that the American justice system calls a murderer. Uh, so who was he? Well, I have to say we've never met face to face. Uh, I can't go to see any of the four uh, who are still in prison because of American prison regulations. If you don't know them, if you didn't know them before, uh, you can't get put on the list. Um, I wrote to him in, in May of 2010, and by then I'd, I, I'd started to do some research and I'd read accounts and I knew a little bit more about the trial. Uh, and one of the things that was most important to me in many ways uh, was reading uh, an interview that Saul Landau did with Gerardo in jail. It was a telephone interview. Um, and I, I was intrigued and, and, and fascinated and delighted to find that this existed. I was less intrigued to realize that the interview had been conducted in Spanish and I didn't speak Spanish, uh, and that uh, it had been done on the phone, so therefore he wasn't able to uh, uh, talk to people face to face, which is, makes it much more difficult to interview someone. So anyway, I wrote him a letter. It was a long letter, a long, complicated letter explaining why the hell it was that I wanted to talk to him in the first place. And uh, I wrote down 23 different questions that I had for him. And I told him that there would be more uh, because I was really just getting started. And so I had the letter translated by one of my students uh, and sent it off. And uh, a few weeks later, I got this reply. I am writing in English in order to give a break to your student. <laughs> he hastened to add that she was an excellent translator, but from then on, he, he uh, corresponded with me in English throughout and, and continues to do that to this day. Um, and that, I think, is the reason I can't speak Spanish. It's because he made it too easy uh, for me not to learn. But I have to say, when, when you get a letter from Gerardo, and it, it's a, it's a, it's a print-on-paper letter of the old-fashioned variety. And he writes uh, in a printed script. Uh, he writes long letters in, in printed script. And it's just, you know, it's like a, a little art form when you get it in, in the mail. And you know, I, whenever I see the address, uh, I sort of rip it open, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. The first, the first letter he wrote, uh, you know, he, he ex answered some of my questions, said he would answer others later. And then he sent me probably a dozen, 15, maybe 20 pages of photocopied material 
uh, because he thought that if I was serious about this, I should do a little more reading before I asked him any more questions. So that, that we, we've had that kind of uh, relationship since then. Um, I, you know, it has been, uh, it's, it's wonderful to get those letters, but it's, it's shocking to think that the reason you get those letters is because he can't use email. He can't <laughs> send information uh, correspond with people like the rest of us do in this day and age. And that's uh, just one of the many uh, irritations that exist in uh, his life right now in prison. Um, that some of them are not so uh, serious. They're, they're minor irritations, but, but the big one is that uh, he's not allowed uh, to be with his wife, Adriana. And um, if you know anything about his, his relationship with Adriana, you know how, how much that is really a problem. And the fact is that uh, when he was arrested, he was uh, 31, she was 26. Uh, they intended to have children. Uh, and they were, at that stage, he was uh, trying to convince the Cuban government to let uh, him bring Adriana to join him in Florida. Uh, it, was a, it was a request that didn't get answered. Uh, before he was arrested, uh, but part of the reason for that was because they really did want to have, begin to have a family. Um, I'll tell you, I'll t I, I won't read it this time because it, it, I, I see Bill looking at me and saying, you know, you're talking on, but I, I'll, t I'll tell you the, the, the short version of how they met because it does uh, tell you something about uh, Gerardo. Uh, he was 21, she was 16, he was a student in the uh, institute, uh, I don't do the, the Spanish very well, but it's, it's, it's where diplomats are trained. Uh, it's a very special school. He was there, he had to travel on three buses in order to get there, and he had to get up at four in the morning. But his father would sometimes drive him, except that he got into a fight with his father, and they were having a little back and forth, and he just, uh, Gerardo decided he wasn't going to drive with his father, he was going to take the bus. Gets to the final bus stop, there she is, Adriana. He'd never seen her before. He describes it as instant in love. He's in love with this woman uh, immediately. The next morning, forget about his father. He gets up and he takes the bus so he can get to the bus stop and give her the poem. He's written her in class the day before. The, po the poem to the girl at the bus stop because he doesn't know her name. Now the truth is that Adrienne is not all that interested at this point. Uh, she's 16, you know, he's 21, she's not all that keen on this guy. Uh, so when she realizes what he's up to, she gets up, up earlier the next day so that she can take the earlier bus so she won't have to talk to him. <laughs> the next day, Gerardo takes an even earlier set of buses to get there in advance, Br brings and hands to her a poem he's written for her plus flowers that he's stolen from a neighbor's garden on the way <laughs> to the bus. That was, after that it was a little less difficult and Adriana says that you know, he wasn't that bad. So uh, they, they were uh, married in 1988. Uh, they didn't spend that much time together because he was off in Angola. He was uh, part of the Cuban mission to Angola. And he came back and he got this mission uh, to the United States in 1994. Uh, so, he comes to the United States, he, he leaves her, and, and again, like everybody else, like uh, Antonio, uh, like Rene, uh, have to lie about what it is they do, even to their family, because it's the only way they can protect the mission. And that, that creates all sorts of, of tensions and personal difficulties, particularly for Gerardo and, and Adriana, who shared everything else. And so she thinks that he's, an Argent he's a diplomat uh, working for Cuba in Argentina. And this is the special period, he can't take her with him, uh, and he can only come back once in a while on vacation. Uh, so when he gets there, what is it that he does? He's, a, he's an illegal intelligence officer, uh, which means he's operating under an assumed name uh, in a foreign country with no sort of backup or anything else. And he, uh, in, 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 what he in, in his day-to-day -day work, uh, works with agents like Antonio, who was working out of Boca Chica and gathering information about uh, planes on the runways there to find out if, the, if there was a plan to uh, attack Cuba. And you know, this was a time of Grenada, Panama, 
uh, Haiti invasions were not that uncommon. So that was an important thing. Rene was in, infiltrating uh, groups like Brothers to the Rescue. Um, and, and so he would get their reports, uh, report back to uh, Havana on, on what they, they said, get instructions back from Havana. It sounds a bit more uh, you know, that he was the middleman he wasn't really. He was actually pretty active in, in some of the investigations that they did. But he also was uh, in charge of these agents. And, and he had to get them to do what Havana wanted the, them to do. But he also had to protect them uh, if, if he thought they needed protecting. And he, he was almost paternal in the way he dealt with the, the other agents. Uh, he was worried about Rene uh, because Rene was working too hard. He, he had a I mean. We talk about agents. Forget the sort of James Bond stuff here. These guys were working three jobs, right, in order to pay the rent. Uh, and Rene was, was saving money because he wanted his wife Olga and daughter Irma to be with him, and so he didn't spend any money. Um, when, when Olga and Irma came, there was a, a, a time when uh, Irma, who was, I think, six at the time, was very upset about having been forced to leave Cuba. She had a little Cuba shrine in her room. And Gerardo was worried about what was going on, as, as were Rene and, and Olga. And uh, so Gerardo came up with this idea that uh, Rene should buy a, a VCR. And uh, that way they, they could show her interesting programs from, uh, uplifting programs, as I think as he put it, from, from in Spanish. Um, and then he realized Rene was kind of cheap. And he didn't have much money. And this wasn't going to happen. So at some point, Gerardo bought him a VCR. And if you realize that Gerardo was also pretty cheap most of the time, uh, this tells you something about uh, you know, his, his responses to that. He counseled Tony about Maggie. And uh, the Havana couldn't understand Tony very well because he was this interesting, uh, eclectic, sort of funky guy who would sign off his reports back to Havana as your vegetarian friend, Tony. Uh, and he was into Zen Buddhism. He was into a whole bunch of things that didn't sort of fit the, anybody's idea back in Havana about what he should be doing. But Tony was always, or, or Gerardo was always uh, defending him. Um, there was another agent couple who didn't get arrested, uh, or who did, I guess they did get arrested and they copped a plea. But uh, one time the mother-in-law was coming over from Cuba to live with them and the mother-in-law had caused all sorts of problems in the marriage before, Gerardo spent an afternoon trying to sort out uh, you know, uh, what to do and how to, how to help them out. Um, so who is this guy, this murderer? This is the guy who is the, the murderer. I tell you all that because I did read the 20,000 pages of transcript. Uh, I read the thousands of pages uh, of evidence that was presented from FBI uh, encryption, uh, documents that they decrypted that went back and forth between Havana and Miami. And there is no evidence whatsoever to indicate that Gerardo was involved in any plot to murder anybody, certainly not the flyers of the uh, brothers to the rescue who were shot down. We can argue about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, whether it was legitimate for Cuba to do. doesn't matter. He wasn't involved. He should never have been charged. The reason he was charged was because Fidel wasn't available. That's as simple as it gets. The, the Cuban exile community in Miami was very upset by this uh, shoot down from two years before, still upset. Uh, and I think what happened is the FBI were trying to appease them in a certain sense. And, and we know that the charge against Gerardo was not laid immediately. They were, these, the, the group were arrested. It took them seven months to come up with the charge of conspiracy to commit murder. And they were so, the prosecutors were so unsure of the evidence that they had for that charge that they presented the evidence uh, during the trial. When the trial ended, the judge had issued her instructions to the jury, but before the jury actually started to deliberate, the prosecutors rushed off to Atlanta to the appeal court and said, look, we want to drop this uh, conspiracy to commit murder charge because we don't believe we have enough evidence, we've shown enough evidence to do it. The appeal court said, no, you know, you presented this evidence, let the jury decide. Unfortunately, uh, as we recognize about Miami juries, didn't take them any time to decide that Gerardo was guilty whether there was evidence or not. And so 
Uh, he is now in jail, double life sentence, plus 15 years. The case obviously isn't just about him. Uh, but in a sense, if you look at the trial and you look at the evidence in the other cases, the conspiracy to commit murder charge was the one uh, that dominated. It's probably the reason why they all got the sentences that they did, just because you know, they were all guilty, in a sense, by association with this. Uh, which is why I know some of you are, are activists, uh, some of you perhaps are not, but I think those of us who pay any attention to this case owe it to ourselves to be in a position to counter that ar the arguments that people make that, uh, oh, we can't release Gerardo, we can't release the five because they were involved in murder, or another bogus charge that they were somehow involved in stealing American military secrets and damaging national security. No evidence for either one. Uh, but we need to be able to take that message to other people who right now don't know anything about the case, but what they do know about the case, they're prepared to believe from the State Department. And you know, that just simply isn't, isn't on. So I think um, this is a week in which we have marked, not celebrated, but marked the 15th anniversary uh, of the arrest of the five. Uh, we are now into the 16th year. 16 years uh, that they've lost, and I think uh, you know it's it's really important that we do whatever we can now to make sure that there is no 17th anniversary. Thank you very much.